front, the Madison story, a booklet for each one of our visitors. It's our gift to you. We're all thrilled and delighted to welcome Dan McCord back today. We just think it's so wonderful that Dan's already out of the hospital and right here. We've just been praying for him and uh, just so thankful that that terrible, serious accident, his life's been spared and the darling little daughter and all the family sitting together today. That's wonderful. I'm sharing with you today a lesson that I deem especially appropriate in view of upcoming events, the 12th day of September. Brother Bill Rule shared the lesson from the 14th chapter of the book of Matthew. You know, Herod had heard of the fame of our Lord Jesus, and he had beheaded John the Baptist. And then Herod thought that Jesus was John the Baptist come back to life. And John disciples took up the corpse of John the Baptist and buried him. And then they went and told Jesus. And when our blessed Lord learned of it, he took his disciples and went out into a desert place, a thinly populated area. The people saw Jesus and his disciples leaving, and they followed him. They likely traveled about anywhere from 12 to 20 miles. And they arrived apparently about the time of our Lord. And when Jesus saw the multitude, he was moved with compassion, the Bible says. It reminded him of sheep that had no shepherd. Many of the multitude, no doubt, were disciples of the beloved John the Baptist. And Jesus taught the multitudes concerning the kingdom of God, and he healed their sick. And when evening was come, the Bible says that the Lord Jesus uh, told the disciples to feed the multitude. Jesus said, give ye them to eat. And the disciples said, well, shall we go away into the village and take 200 shillings and try to buy some bread? And our blessed Lord said, how many loaves have you? And Andrew reported that there was a lad here who has five loaves, five barley loaves, and two fishes. And Jesus instructed his disciples then to have all the people sit down in company of fifties. And he gave thanks, and he told the disciples to feed the multitude. And the multitude was filled, the Bible says in Luke 9, 17. And lo and behold, twelve baskets were taken up from the broken pieces which remained. Now on the twelfth day of September, on this corner, we hope ourselves to feed the five thousand. It'd be a little bit different than the time when our Lord fed them. We may run short of food. I'm going to ask every lady in this congregation to prepare food on Saturday. You know, the reason we're having that midnight sing on Friday night, all that big tent with Bernard Lassiter and Ray Walker and Dwight Lanham is where the women can cook on Saturday for this big day. All old bachelors who cannot cook I am going to ask you to stop at the bakery or the supermarket and buy something. Don't come empty-handed. It's going to be a wonderful thing. You know, there's something fascinating about a dinner on the ground. I like to stand back and watch the dessert table. Here come along this little boy, about 10 years old. And he sees there Polly Bean's famous uh, banana pudding, Polly Fessmeyer's famous coconut cream uh, banana cake, Joanne Tyler's famous pecan pies, Mrs. O.A. Wakefield's famous fresh coconut cake, Mrs. North's famous chocolate cake, and somebody's brought a watermelon, and the little fellow's trying to make up his mind. And you can tell that the decisions are killing him because he's wanting some of it all. We may run short of food. If we do, it'll be all right. We'll just eat everything there and then quit and fast. But it's going to be, it's going to be a marvelous and, and beautiful occasion. Now, when we feed the 5,000, and I think if we have 7,001 in Sunday school, there'll be 5,000 who will stay to eat. I want you to remember this day and the long ago when our Lord performed one of the most unusual miracles in all the Bible. 
Let's think about it today. In this miracle, we observe that there is that which typifies the Lord himself. The bread was multiplied and became sufficient for all, just like the manna that fell from heaven in the wilderness in the long ago that fed the children of Israel. And that was typical of Jesus the Christ, who is our bread of life. You know, this is a very special miracle. In fact, it's the only miracle in the Bible, as far as I know, that's recorded in all the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Every one of them tell about this miracle. It was a wonderful display of the power of God and the majesty of Jesus Christ. Apparently, something was created from nothing. But you know, it required no more wisdom or power than was required to put into operation the provisions of nature which feed millions year by year in our own planet. And then I'd like for you to note in this miracle and observe with me the compassion of Jesus Christ. He commanded that the hungry people be fed. The Bible says he had compassion on them. He healed their sick. And he had compassion on their spiritual needs. The Bible said he taught them concerning the kingdom of God. You know, Jesus came to save us. He came to seek and save the lost. He wanted our spiritual needs to be fulfilled. But also, he was compassionate to their physical needs. It grieves me greatly in religion today and churches of Christ many times and in denominational churches too all over the nation. There seems to be such an attitude of, we don't care if a man is hungry. It is not up to us to fulfill his physical needs. Let the Masons or the Catholics or the federal government or the, somebody else take care of the homeless children and the orphans and the poor. And there's many a church who can preach the horns off of a brass billy goat but they can't even practice pure and undefiled religion as much as the little Lions Club that meets in a hotel room. And they sit there stale and dead. Nobody even cares. And year after year, they do not grow. And some of them are smaller than they were 10 years ago. And they wonder why. Ladies and gentlemen, Jesus cared for the spiritual needs, but he cared for the physical needs. And he tells us in Galatians chapter 6, to do good unto all men, as you have therefore opportunity, do good unto all men, and especially the household of faith. A few days ago, a lady came through town, and she had four babies. She was pregnant with a fifth, and she came in here, and she said, you know, they told me if I could find the Madison Church of Christ that I could get home. She said, my husband died out west. And we're from West Virginia, and I'm trying to get home with these children. I have 35 cents. Yes, we helped her financially with food, filled the car with gas. Somebody said, well, I'll tell you one thing. Her husband might have been right out of town waiting for her. And that just might have been a ploy, might have been used in 25 cities. It might. That's true. But I'll tell you one thing. That $20 we spent on her, the God of heaven may give us a hundredfold interest. He may bring this church a hundred thousand dollars for that twenty. We showed compassion. And you know, really, that's what it's all about. James 1, 27 says, Religion that is pure, that is undefiled, that pleases God, takes care of the little homeless children and the widows and keeps oneself unspotted from the world. Yes, the Lord Jesus showed a compassion. He showed a compassion not only for the spiritual needs, but for the physical needs. In this miracle, we learn that Jesus can supply and meet our every need. There's never a reason to depart from Jesus. If you give your heart to Jesus, if you put the kingdom first, the Lord supplies all your needs, physical needs and spiritual needs. Jesus says, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. I believe it, don't you? Jesus says the God of heaven takes care even of the sparrow, even from the birds, 
even from the lilies of the field. Don't you think he can take care of you? Oh, ye of little faith. There's no reason to turn from the Lord, for he can provide for our physical needs and our spiritual needs. On one occasion, they were leaving our Lord by apparently wholesale numbers. And uh, they said, it's a hard saying, it's a hard teaching. Who can hear it? And when they left, Jesus turned to his disciples and he said, are you going to leave me too? And the apostle Peter said, Lord, to whom shall we go? Thou hast the words of eternal life. There is none other. In this miracle, we learn that Jesus can make use of seemingly little and insignificant possessions and talents. Doesn't make any difference how small our talents, how little a thing is. When it's turned over to the Lord Jesus, some wonderful things can happen. You know, after all said and done, it's that little Adam that really holds the world in consternation today. It's so small that we can, the layman, people like myself, uh, do not have a lot of scientific training. It's hard for us to understand that atom. And yet the splitting of that atom is the thing that holds the world in consternation even to this good day. It's wonderful what God has done with little things. He's made all out of the atom. He's made time out of seconds. He's made the oceans out of little drops of water. He records the importance of little things and says even a cup of cold water given in the name of Jesus shall in no wise lose its reward. It's not the big things every time that counts. I was talking to an elder the other day and he says, you know, in our congregation, we live in a college town, we have dozens of PhDs, dozens and dozens of men with the highest skill and the highest academic degrees. And then Lambert said, we're dead, we're lukewarm, we're dying. I said, what's your problem? He said, the truth of it is, everybody wants to be a chief and nobody wants to be an Indian. Everybody wants to draw up a big plan like you do at the university and supervise, but nobody wants to get his hands dirty in really doing the job. Sometimes it might be a man with a small talent who will commit it to the Lord Jesus can be used in a mightier way than man with much but who doesn't want to really get his hands dirty in doing the work of the Lord. And then in this miracle, we observe that Jesus proceeded his work in an orderly manner. I think that's significant. He says, you divide this great company into groups of 50 and then serve them. You know, the Lord wants everything done decently and in order. I was talking to someone the other day and he said, I don't like a structured service. I like for everybody to speak up and, and you don't know what time you're going to meet and you don't know what time it's going to turn out. I said, I don't like that because I don't think it's right. I want a structured service. I want to know when the service is going to begin. I want to know when it's in and I want to know what's going on because I believe the Bible requires it. In fact, the Bible says, let all things be done decently and in order. 1 Corinthians chapter 14 and verse 40. Someone said the other day to me, where do you get the scripture for departments in your Bible school? I said, 1 Corinthians chapter 14 and verse 40. We can't turn loose hundreds of people and say, let's go to Bible class. We want to be graded. We want to be decent. We want it to be ordered. I visited our Sunday school today, as I do almost every Sunday, our junior high department today, and I tell you, it's, it's marvelous. It's unbelievable to see so many young men and women so well-behaved, so orderly, listening. That's the way it ought to be. Let all things be done decently and in order. And when I think of Jesus feeding the 5,000, I think of decorum. I think of order. I make no apologies in the churches of Christ that we don't holler and shout and turn somersaults and, and everybody talk at once and jabber. For God has called us to sanity, not insanity, to a sane mind. And he says, do all things decently and in order. In this miracle, we observe that Jesus gave thanks for the food. And you know, folks, I, I believe that's significant. And I want to encourage all of you with small children especially. 
It's a wonderful, wonderful policy in your home to just thank God for the food before you eat. Ms. North and I, a few days ago, was invited by one of our little families here in Madison who has four boys and a little baby girl. And they've just bought them a 15-acre farm on Old Brick Church Pike. And they invite us for dinner. And I want to tell you about it. When we sat down to eat, the daddy said, Brother North, we generally have a little devotional uh, at the evening meal uh, before we eat, and we're going to do that today. And I said, that's wonderful. And said, we always sing a song, and said, we're going to sing one uh, tonight. I said, that's fine. And then they cut loose and sang, I'll fly away. And I never heard such singing in my life as they did. And then they had a chain prayer. And all prayed except the little baby girl who's too small yet to talk. You know the thing that impressed me, every child gave God the credit for the food. But every one of those children prayed for the other four uh, by name. Every one of them called the name of every brother and sister, thanked God, and asked the Lord to bless them. And I thought, what beautiful, marvelous, wonderful training. We should accept the fact, as taught in James 1 and 17, every good and perfect gift cometh from the Father above. In this miracle, we observe that Jesus took the opportunity from the occasion to teach a lesson on thrift. I'm sorry we've gotten away from the old American doctrine and American trait of thrift. It had a part in the building of this great nation. You know, Jesus told them, you gather up the fragments, and they gathered up 12 basketfuls. This showed that he wanted nothing wasted. We sin when we waste. Someone has said half the world goes to bed hungry, and the other half wastes enough to feed the first half. My dear sweet mother was stingy according to many, definition of many. I don't think she was. But she believed in thrift and was the thriftiest person I've ever known. I remember as a child one night at supper and at Etheridge we never had dinner except at 12 o'clock. We always had supper in the evening. And I poured out too much saga molasses. And I, I didn't think much about it until Mama said, Son, did you know it's a sin to waste? I said, I didn't go aim to do it, Mama. He said, Yeah, but you did it. And said, I'll tell you what we're going to do. What we're going to do, Mama? He said, We're going to set your plate in the warming closet. And most of you are too young to know what that means. That's the box that was over the old wood range. And said, We're going to put your plate in the warming closet. Now, in the morning when you come to breakfast, you'll have the same plate and you'll eat the rest of the molasses. And I did. But you know, it doesn't, you don't have to do that many times until you learn to be a little bit more careful and not waste. I'm not ashamed that I was reared like that. And I'd like to see our own beloved nation that God has blessed so bountifully get back to the belief and teaching of our forefathers that thrift is honorable and that waste is sinful and wrong. We can waste our time. And this is taught to be sinful in Ephesians 5 and 15. The Lord says, redeeming the time for the days are evil. We can waste our talent by burying them. The Lord teaches us in Matthew 25 and verse 14 to 30. We can waste our money. And that's sinful too. For if we belong to Christ, all we have belongs to Christ. And wastefulness is sinfulness, whether it's in time or talent, ability, or money. Now, in conclusion, let us make some spiritual applications of this miracle. And especially, I hope, two weeks from today, we'll have a pretty day and feed the 5,000, and you'll think about what our Lord did the long ago in the Sea of Galilee. I visited that traditional place, and it's very easy in your imagination to see the Lord in this beautiful, beautiful land right there by the sea, having those 5,000 people sit down. You know, the traditional place where they fed the 5,000 is like all the other places in the Bible land. It fits what the Bible says. And 
uh, it's easy to believe. Yes, this surely could have happened right here. Let's remember this. As the multitude was drawn to Jesus, just so people are drawn to Jesus today. And that multitude in the long ago that needed the Lord doesn't need him any more than you do and I do. And just as Jesus received them and had compassion and love for them, he'll receive you and receive me. Jesus fed their bodies and he fed their souls. And if we commit ourselves to him, he's going by his providence to permit us to make a living. And he's going to supply our spiritual needs. As the multitude was hungering for that physical food in the long ago, the world today is hungering for the spiritual food, something for the heart and soul. The Bible teaches that he came to seek and save the lost. He came to redeem us. Jesus had compassion on the multitude, and he has compassion on the multitude today. As the disciples carried the food to the multitude, just so the disciples today are to carry the spiritual food to the multitude. He has charged us to take the gospel into all the world. And as the multitude was filled, their hunger was satisfied, so those of us who come to Jesus today are going to be satisfied and filled. I wonder if there's one here today who would come to the Lord, who will commit all you have and all you are to the Lord Jesus. If you'll come through faith and repentance, be baptized into Christ, wear his name and serve him, the Lord will be yours. And though it might seem mighty meager to you, the Lord will take your talents and take your life and multiply it many fold for the good of mankind and for the glory of God. You can abide through Christ and faithfulness. And you can then have the right to the tree of life. You know, the Bible says in the last chapter in the book of Revelations that we'll have a right to the tree of life. We'll enter in through the gates to the city. It doth not yet appear what we shall be like, but we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Would you come? Let's stand and everybody enjoy singing together.